Good day, folks. So we're going to start today on our third in our series of transistor projects. And we're going to look at the class B and, and ultimately the class AB amplifier. And we'll get into why that in a second or two. This is another video sponsored by our good friends over at PCB Way. Now here we have a, a picture of a very simple looking class B amplifier. The reason it's a class B amplifier is that only half of the circuit conduct at a time. But it's got some issues. So, you know, we put in an input signal like this and what will happen is as the voltage goes up above one half VCC, eventually it'll get up to one half VCC plus 0.7 and this transistor here will begin to conduct. And that will give us a, a waveform like this. Time will go by, then we'll get the waveform coming out and it'll come back. As it comes down this side, it goes down from one half VC plus 0.7 down through one half VCC and then down to one half VCC minus 0.7, then this transistor will start to conduct and we'll get this part of the trace. And basically what's happening is this, when this one's conducting, it's charging up the capacitor and doing that charging through the load. And when this one starts to conduct, it's discharging the capacitor through the load, whatever that load may be. But as you can see here, while this is a fairly efficient kind of arrangement, it is very highly distorted. You have this called crossover distortion. However, there is a way we can get around that. But before I show you that, why don't we go on over to get a word from our sponsor. Okay, here we are over at PCB Way. What I'm going to do here is going into the quick order. Okay, so then I can just click on add my Gerber files. So you just choose a file where you've zipped up all your Gerber files and your drill file and you open it up. So here we are, it's, it's decided that we have a two layer board and it's got the dimensions correctly. Now all we have to do is choose our options. You have a lot of different options here. It's a two layer board, but if you were to go in and just get a quote and you wanted a quote on a four layer version of the board, you can click on that and it'll change the prices up here accordingly. You can choose your material, the thickness of the board. 1.6 is fine, but you could put in a thinner board or a thicker board, depending on what your needs are. And of course, the prices will be updated accordingly. Um, we'll stick with the 1.6. This is not a very complicated board, so we don't need very, very fine track spacing and track width, but you can have it even wider or you can have much, much narrower. Minimum hole size, again, if you require very, very, very small hole sizes, you can select that too. Three millimeters, pretty much the standard. What color do you want your board? So you choose a, a solder mask here to make the board whatever color you want. Uh, so pretty well when you do it, it, it's clever enough to notice exactly what it is would work best for you. So you can make little changes here if you want. As such as surface finish. The, the standard is hot air solder leveling with lead-based solder. Immersion gold is not too expensive and I've done boards in immersion gold too where I wanted something that I don't want the, the board to tarnish. Um, via process, you want your, your via is tented, plugged, or not covered. Now this is about the weight of the copper or the thickness of the copper on the board. And standard for most boards is one ounce copper. Now it's just a matter of choosing your shipping method. Choose whatever shipping method you want and then save it to the cart. Then it's just a simple matter of putting in your information and paying for it. PCB prototype the easy way. It really is. All right, welcome back. So let's see what our solution to this problem is. So what we do then is we put in uh, two more resistors, or it could be just one, but most times we draw it as two resistors. And what we do with these is we bias it such that this point here is already at VCC plus 0.7 volts, and this point here is at 0.5 VCC minus 0.7 volts. And then we drive both of these points directly from our signal and that will eliminate the crossover distortion because these are all ready to conduct. In fact, they are conducting a little bit. So what they actually do is they kind of share a little bit of the conduction region and cross over smoothly from one to the other. Now, <clears throat> there's an issue here too. The problem being is that uh, as transistors and resistors warm up, uh, they change their value and they don't necessarily do it the same. So what, what tends to happen is, um, you know, an ordinary resistor will, this resistance will increase. And as we increase 
the voltage here, the current through this transistor will increase, causing its temperature to increase and causing this junction here, the voltage to drop. So it may drop from 0.7 volts to 0.65 volts. And that's going to cause the current to increase, which is going to cause the temperature to increase. So basically what you end up doing is going into thermal runaway. And it's almost impossible to stop. Now, there, there is a way around that, but it requires using special resistors, thermistors with a negative coefficient, so that when they heat up, the resistance goes down. And what that'll tend to do is reduce the current going through here if these warm up sufficiently so that you, it doesn't run away. But those, we don't all have those resistors in our back pocket, and they're difficult to spec for the particular transistor that you are using. So you'd have to kind of match them. So is there possibly a better way to get that than having to go through the trouble of buying negative temperature coefficient thermistors? Well, yeah, there is. So uh, another way to do it is with a silicon diode. So if you're using a silicon transistor with a 0.7 volt base emitter voltage drop and you use a diode with a 0.7 volt voltage drop across it too, you can get the right bias here without having to worry too much about special resistors. But Again, there's a bit of a problem with this. If the temperature behavior of this transistor and this diode are not exactly the same, you can just as easily get into the thermal runaway as well. But your average diode that you have in your junk box and your average transistor that you have in your junk box, they're not going to be compatible, generally speaking. You're going to have to match your diodes to your transistors. Now, is there a better way to do this? Yes, again, there is. So you can come up with this. And what this means is that you use exactly the same transistors you have there and you connect it up as a diode. So it's going to have exactly the same base emitter diode thermal characteristics and they're going to match each other. So if it does get a little bit warmer or does change its, its uh, forward voltage, this is going to change by exactly the same amount, keeping the bias precisely where it should be and not causing the transistor to go into thermal runaway. And same down here. Now, if you look at this, this looks like a fairly simple circuit. Uh, it's not too bad, but you're going to have to have a very low impedance drive to, to get this to work out well. Plus, you need these two capacitors. So let's look at the design I came up with here. All right, we're back. So this is what I've come up with. We're going to use uh, easy to come by PN2222A and a PN2907A as our complementary pair on the output here. And that means, of course, we've got our advising diodes. We need to use a PN222A and a PN2907A. Now, what we're going to do here, we're not going to drive it directly into the low impedance points. We're going to use a 2N3904 here as a, a current source. Since these are connected up this way as current mirrors, we're going to get whatever current we set here, we're going to get it going down through here too. So we want a little bit of current in order to avoid that crossover. And what I'm planning to do is I'm going to put 4.3 milliamps down through this here. So we have to adjust this bias. And that's why I don't have a definite amount of resistance down here to get the bias right. And there's a reason for that, which I'll, I'll try to remember to get to. So we put down 4.3 milliamps down through here. That'll put uh, 4.3 volts across this resistor. And because we've got 10 volts up here, minus 4.3 volts, it's going to get us down to 5.7 at this point. And this will drop us down 0.7 volts, and this will drop us down 0.7 volts, so that we'll be down here to 4.3 volts here too. As we adjust this bias here, we need to see 5.7 here, we need to see 5 here, 4.3 here, or 0.43 here. And that's how we'll set up the bias. But this gives us a much, much higher input impedance. It also gives us a little bit of gain. So this, the way it's set up now, is going to have a gain uh, roughly about 10. So why do we put a variable resistor here? Why don't we just pull a resistor off the shelf? Well, for one thing, if you do all the math here and completely ignore the impedance that we see through here, I just go by resistors that we have. We'd need a, a 12,750 ohm resistor here to provide the 1.13 volts here and therefore provide 0.43 volts at this point. There's no such thing as a 12,750 ohm resistor unless you go to a resistor that costs you maybe about three to five dollars a piece. We don't want to do that. And besides that, 12,750 is not going to be exactly right because we also here, we have the impedance of this as seen through the base of the transistor. And we don't know the exact gain of this transistor. So it's going to be impossible to calculate it. That's why we have a variable resistor here. And I put two 22 ohms here. 
Uh, the reason being, if I drive eight ohms directly with, let's say five volts peak to peak, you're pretty well going to be running these transistors at their maximum. I don't want to do that. So it also provides a little bit of short circuit protection. And the reason I'm using two of them, I've got a pile of quarter watt resistors. This gives us a half a watt of resistance here. So they should be fine. So this should be a very, very stable, low distortion, low to mid range power amplifier of the class AB type. When the input signal is zero crossing, both of these transistors are conducting at the same time, and that's class A. And the B comes from when you only have one or the other operating at a time. All right, so let's see what kind of circuit board we came up for this. That's it, very simple. I use a slightly thicker traces than I did the last time. Thick traces have a lower inductance, so at, at higher frequencies, they'll become less of a, an impedance. Again, I've got a ground plane, force of habit. I'll always put those down there. And, and that's about it. So I've already sent these off to PCB way and uh, they should be making them up as we speak. And hopefully when the boards get in, I'm actually going to put two of them together. I'm going to put one together with the input capacitor and one without. The one without is going to pair up with one of our class A amplifiers. And we might even try putting two class A's in series and then the class AB to give us something with a very high gain and see how that works out first. My guess is it'll be picking up all sorts of EMI and amplifying that for us, which may not be ideal. Anyway, that's it, guys. Uh, thanks for joining me, and uh, we'll see you in the next video, and we'll certainly see you when the boards come in and we build this up. Thanks. Bye-bye.